currently Kootenai County Fire and Rescue has four stations. Uh, as you all know, we have significant growth uh, that we're already currently facing and uh, as we anticipate uh, continuing to grow by 2040, we understand that we are underserved already. With the latest census numbers that we are projected to get for our fire district, because we don't just cover the city of Post Falls, we cover surrounding areas and the city of Dalton Gardens. Uh, we understand that the latest census numbers look like we're going to be at 52 or 53,000 citizens in our fire district. The stations uh, built currently don't take into a diverse workforce. Obviously, when the, we have stations as old as 1974, uh, we didn't have women in the fire service back then, and so we have to take into account things like that. And we also aren't statistically in the best location as you look at growing demand and growing need for service. Uh, and, they, and definitely our current stations don't meet the, the future planning of either Post Falls or the county as a whole. So uh, we have always been, had a linear response. If you know anything about our fire stations, all of them are currently within a mile of I-90, either north or just south of I-90. Uh, and as you are very well aware and people point out to you on a regular basis, Post Falls is no longer linear and along I-90. It's growing far to the north, south, west, uh, so we know that we have to change our plan. We know that we have to, we have to make a plan that complements that growth. And we know that our current plan to grow this meets the current need, but in the future we're going to be looking at the northwest corner of, the, of Post Falls. We're going to look at south of the river and our, as the population there continues to grow, looking at what kind of response we can offer there. And then looking at our highest call volume here in the center of Post Falls is how do we meet the demand for service there, not maybe with just a single engine in a station, but are we looking at having to have more than one company in a station? So currently our facility station one right up the street on 4th Street is actually in the center of Post Falls. It's in a great location and we don't plan to move it. Station two at Celtis and Pleasant View is also in a great location and in a growing location. Uh, it was built in the late uh, 2000 or in the late 1999 and uh, it serves our citizens on the west side very well and is, a, and is in a great location. Station three, which is at 16th and Highway 41 is the busiest station we have but does not serve us well because it cannot get to the north and to the west fast enough. Our goal is to have the first unit on scene of an emergency within four minutes and 59 seconds of the call, at least 90% of the time. And for the first time ever, we are not meeting that goal any longer. And so uh, it's, it cannot be, meet both north and south demand. And then station four, which isn't in the city of Post Falls, right across the street from the Croc Center, actually was our, is our oldest station built in 1974, and DEQ has told us we can no longer inhabit it as a fire station. It's, uh, the infrastructure does not allow it to be used as a facility like that under its current state, and it would take over a million dollars of infrastructure just to improve that site. We actually don't even own all of the land that site's on. So, uh, all, and all stations are at capacity for vehicle storage, and our maintenance facilities currently doesn't have room to store. So this kind of gets us into what our facilities are included in the bond. It's actually taking Station 3, which is at Highway 41 and 16th, and moving it to Prairie, just west of Highway 41. We think that this will meet our demand on Prairie, the growing Prairie Corridor. It will allow us to go east and west. It will allow us to get that northern and western boundary of Post Falls better served. Station 4 would actually move from the Croc Center to over on uh, Kathleen at the fairgrounds. This would allow us to better serve Dalton Gardens and the eastern side of our fire district, which includes the east side of Coeur d'Alene out in the Wolf Lodge area uh, better and more quickly. This would also include adding Station 5, which would be at our training center at Celtis, just west of Hutter. Uh, this actually, the addition of Station 5, and we're going to show you on a map here in a minute, the addition of Station 5 actually puts Station 3, Station 5, and Station 1 all protecting the core of Post Falls. And, and on the map, it looks like there's triple coverage, and there is, but very rarely do we have everybody sitting in a station just re waiting to go to a call. So the triple coverage gets you within three miles of a fire station three times as long as one of those people, or as long as all of those people are in house. It also includes an outdoor classroom. This is the cheapest of the products, projects, but we have no restroom facilities, locker room facilities, 
for new recruits. We have no way for the recruits to spend a day of training in a smoke trailer or the burn trailer or sweating and take a shower. We have no way to hose off afterwards and we don't allow gear or dirty bodies inside our training center for cancer prevention. So this actually takes an opportunity and gives us a way and we, we share this facility, the Post Falls PD uses it. We allow any first response agency in the region to come and benefit from our training facility. And then it includes a logistics warehouse, a storage facility for those extra vehicles. As we looked at how to better serve, we figured out that building a new fire station is about $300 to $350 a square foot right now. That's too expensive to build for storage. So we're looking at building a, just a, a warehouse that would better serve us logistically for about $115 a square foot and take care of our needs for years to come. Take vehicles that we don't use every day or our reserve vehicles because we have to keep reserve vehicles and put those in, in a place that's not as expensive to man. Reasons for the project. Obviously we want to meet that goal. The faster response times for our emergency calls. Enhance service to our growing district. Alignment of the stations to better meet our community needs. Again, when the last station was built in 1999, I don't think anybody envisioned Post Falls to look like it currently does. And that's okay, that's no one's fault. That's just growth and growth has taken over. One of the things that we're looking at as we look at these stations is making sure that it takes growth and working with the city and working with the county planners to look at where growth is taking us so that we don't have to relocate stations ever again. That in seven, eight, seven years when it's time to add the sixth station to Post Falls, and it will be, that we look at we've already planned for how to make that happen and not have to move other people because our plans have complemented each other along the way. The other piece of this by putting stations closer together is it makes it safer for citizens. The less time that we have to run code or lights and sirens to a scene and the closer we are to a scene reduces risk for the community naturally. Safety, it meets the growing demands of our region. You'll see on the next slide the increase in emergency calls we've had, but it, we do have growing demands. And I think, uh, I'm sure Chief Knight would attest to, to the growing demands on the police department, but public safety is being taxed like we've never been taxed before. As we look at the, it, it, and it's a combination of the increase in, in our, the size of population, but it's the increase of the, the age of the population, it's the increase of the type of people moving here. It, if you look at last year, certainly with the pandemic, we saw a much sicker, much more acutely ill population that we dealt with. Uh, it augments the training campus for area first responders and it, it adds an apparatus that we don't have in our toolbox. It adds a 107 foot ladder truck. And you might think, gosh, we don't have a lot of tall buildings in Post Falls. But as we look at the future, we look at the buildings that are being proposed out in the Pleasant View corridor. We know that the tech park's coming, uh, fingers crossed that the tech park's coming, but we know that there are people that have looked at it and said, hey, it'd be great if we could put a million square foot facility there. We know that there's a hotel interested somewhere that wants to be five stories. As we look at that, we can't do that with a 75 foot ladder, which is what we currently have in service. So we know that in 107 is the tallest they make. So if they made 140, we'd probably look at 140 for the future. That's just not in the cards. Finally, the community, 34.5% population growth from 2010 to 2020. In that same time though, we grew, we grew our call volume by 63%. Now we're doing 63% more calls with the same number of stations we had in 1999. And so the growth of the currently underserved areas, and Post Falls specifically, we're looking again at that north and western side that we're having trouble meeting those response times to of getting that first apparatus on scene within four minutes and 59 seconds. This is our current station coverage map. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, so those circles are three mile circles. And the idea is we don't want any resident to be more than three miles from a fire station. And people who choose to live far out in the county obviously make a choice that they're going to live more than three miles from a fire station. But people who live in town and especially in hydrated areas are not thinking that they're going to do that. This coverage, this is the new coverage that the new stations would and the realignment of stations. You can see much better coverage north, you can see much better coverage east, and you can see this is where we have that triple coverage. This is Highway 41, this is Idaho Street, and you can see that is our if you look at our high volume, high density call area, that's it. We now are providing three stations within three miles of those areas to provide coverage for the citizens. 
So the specific projects, these are just some renderings. We have uh, done a lot of value engineering to bring the cost down. We think that we have to limit the cost. Uh, we need to be, again, in our, in our effort to be transparent, we're also being responsible with taxpayer money. We have an obligation to do that. Uh, station 3 and Station 4, so the station at the fairgrounds and the station at Prairie and Charleville uh, are uh, mirror stations, sister stations. So that's what you see at station, uh, the, station 3. That would actually be the station on Prairie. Station 5 there is the station at our training center. It does not have the ability to have the same footprint as the other stations because of the, we're limited on size there that it can be. Uh, there on the left you see our storage warehouse and there on the right you see the outdoor concrete classroom. Part of the reason we went with concrete, it doesn't need to be fancy, it truly is dirty people cleaning off or having the ability to go to the restroom while they're training. And this also gives us the ability that they can sit someplace in their turnout fire gear dirty and at the end of the day we simply pull a fire truck up, we hose it off and it's clean. And as simplistic as that sounds, we're very interested in making sure that we prevent cancer in our folks. The other specific projects there, you can just see a ladder truck. You can see that we've gotten to the point already of thinking of how our, our footprints look at all those. The picture on the top is our training campus. The picture on the bottom on the right there is the uh, layout of how Station 3 would look on Prairie. Factors affecting fire stations. So the next slide, I'll just warn you, is the uh, price for the project. And so some people go, man, can't you just build a garage door and a couple of... Uh, uh, a couple, a couple of garage doors and some metal walls and call it good. And unfortunately, all of these factors affect designing a fire station. You got to think that our men and women live there for 48 hours at a time or a third of their lives. So when you think about that and you think about making sure they have those amenities, but you also have to look at how we do business in 2021. Nothing like we did it in 1999, certainly not like we did it in 1984 or 5 when Station 1 was built. And Nothing like we did it in 1974 when Station 4 was built. So all of these factors, gender neutrality, uh, facility maintenance, flexibility of expansion, increased construction costs, uh, longer apparatus or bigger apparatus. Again, you got to have room for a 107-foot ladder truck. Cancer prevention, we take that very seriously. And so people aren't allowed to cross the threshold into the home quarters until they've cleaned up and taken, their, taken all their dirty gear off. And we make sure that all that dirty gear is in isolated rooms where you can't escape. Make the public sick as well. We have to look at increases in technology and security and systems. We have to look at response times. We take everything into account to design a fire station, remote office workspace, uh, station hazards. We have to make sure that we understand it's a public building and the public has the right to use it. And then obviously the security of the building. We're storing millions of dollars in equipment inside these buildings and millions of dollars worth of people, which are our most important resource. So we're very upfront in telling you that the cost of the bond is $14.9 million. It's about $3.7 to $3.8 million to build each station. The outdoor classroom is $250,000. The storage warehouse is uh, 650,000. The 107 foot ladder truck is $1.2 million. The facility equipment, because two of, the or two of the stations will be able to move some equipment, one will be new. So we have to have a breathing air compressor. We have to have a water system. We have to have hydrants inside to fill trucks, things like that. It's about 550,000. We understand that there's bond costs with attorneys. We understand that we have architecture costs. We understand that we have city and county cost in doing business. So the total bond is 14.9 million. The cost to the citizen, we wanna stress, this is not a permanent levy override or a permanent vote. This is sunsetting in 10 years. We think that now's the time to do it for a couple of reasons. We can get an incredibly low interest rate. We can get an interest rate of at the most 1.23% right now. The levy rate or the, the rate to the taxpayer would be $24 on 100,000 dollars worth of property so 20 that's for an average house in Kootenai County and of course that changes every day right now but the average house in Kootenai County is going to pay between 70 and 95 dollars a year in order to increase their safety and it stops in 10 years I really appreciated County Commissioner Duncan yesterday who said man I spend over the course of 10 years I spend a lot more than seven seven hundred and fifty dollars on things that my cell phone bill is a hundred dollars a month and so I appreciated her putting that into perspective for us. We just want to encourage, of course, we're not in the position to ask 
For anything other than we encourage you all to vote, we encourage you to go to our website, look at KootenyFire.com for additional bond information, and uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Chief, thanks for the information. Appreciate it. Uh, it's always nice to know what you're looking at and what the uh, projected <coughs> price, uh, price tag is. Um, you know, good luck on the bond. Got a question. Joe. So as the as your service area grows, so has your tax base been growing. It looks like this is a bond to pay for every cost of everything. Uh, where is the increasing tax base just from the growth going? So the increase from the cost of the growth last year was less than $200,000. So $200,000 went into just paying for the, our increase in insurance alone last year was one hundred and sixty dollars or $170,000 just in our insurance premiums for the, and, and our thought process this year, going forward this year, is that Senate Bill 1108 certainly has the, the uh, depending on the, the outcome, certainly has the ability to limit even that, that going forward. I will tell you one of the things that we are looking at, because what we want to do is make this levy or make this bond a one-time deal is we would, we, and I've talked to uh, Shelly a little bit, but I've also been talking to the county, is we need to look at impact fees for the fire department. Currently the impact fees uh, are not, currently impact fees are not collected for the fire department. And I am a big believer that growth should pay for growth. I'm all in. So if you look at the national trends right now, the average is one fire station for every 10,000 people. Well, if our fire district is gonna meet 52 or 53,000 people this year with the latest census, this just brings us up to meet the current. Our goal is to work with both the city and the county to begin collecting impact fees, but really we feel like that impact is to pay for station six in the future and have enough cash to do that because it's not just a station, it's another engine, it's another you know, set of equipment for the station, is that those impact fees would take care of all future purchases after this. Good. One more question, and you may not have the answer to this off the top of your head, but how much impact is the uh, the numerous urban renewal areas and the lost tax increment having on your ability to raise funds? Uh, I can speak to a couple of them. So we know that uh, one, of the, one of the urban renewal districts that's going to come off either next year or the year after is about $550,000 to us. Uh, and we plan on using those funds to help staff the station so this is just to buy this is just to build the station this doesn't get us to the point of staffing the station and so that URD coming off would fund that but we certainly uh, look at the impact of a URD or, or the uh, both positive and negative I mean growth is good and we and bring business is good but obviously we have to weigh how much of an impact it, the a URD could have yeah, I was just curious because the you know the uh, a common refrain with urban renewal is that it's tax neutral and I don't believe it so uh, if you guys are having to, to raise some bond money because you're not getting that increment, I think that's a pretty good indication of, of the effects it has. So, Definitely. I'll, let, me, let me answer this in a shorter, quicker, and better way for you. If we didn't have URDs and those people were paying us directly our property tax or paying their property taxes that they would owe, it would have a much different impact on our budget to the positive. Thank you. Any questions? I guess just one. Go ahead, so if... Hopefully the levy passes. Would you do you see any issues in being able to have the staffing, the funds for staffing these no, facilities? Uh, no, because I think we've mapped it out with the URD. So that money coming in over the course of the time. By the time Station Five gets built, I mean if the bond passes May 18th, we go into the design and bid phases. We would the priority one has to be moving Station Four from in front of the Croc Center over to the fairgrounds. We hope to break ground on that next February, uh, just mapping out the timeline. We're still probably two to three years away from the station at the, fair, uh, the training center, Station 5, being open. So that maps out perfectly with those URDs to be able to fill that, sta that staffing cost. To get that. Okay. Thank you.